Good evening and welcome to Tuesday of Holy Week. And again, we'll be doing um, evening prayer together. And uh, it may be novel for some of you, um, but I'd really encourage you to try and enter into it. Um, if you have access to a prayer book, or you can, can download one um, from the um, Anglican Church of Canada website, um, then you can follow along um, with us as well. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayers be set forth in your sight as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. I'm going to use the introduction from Psalm 134. Behold now, Bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, you who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy place and bless the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you out of Zion. Our psalm set for today uh, is Psalm 71, and reading from verse 1. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress, to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon you I have learned, we have leaned from my birth. It is you who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have been like a portent to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with praise and your glory all day long. Do not cast me off of the, in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me and those who watch for my life consult together. They say, pursue and seize that person whom God has forsaken, for there is no one to deliver. O God, do not be far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. Let my accusers be put to shame and consumed. Let those who seek to hurt me be covered with scorn and disgrace. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. Our reading for this evening is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who perish, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews, Jews demand a sign and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who, call, who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you who are wise by human standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Jesus Christ, who came for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it is written, that the one who, one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for, etern for, et for, keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came down from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, the voice that came for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of the world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light so the darkness may not overtake you. If you walk in the darkness, you do not know where you are going. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may be become children of light. After Jesus said this, he departed and hid from them. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. John's account of Palm Sunday gives us a better sense of the extent to which people looked to Jesus to rescue them from their desperate plight. As both a shout of acclamation and as a communal prayer, they shout Hosanna, the Aramaic word for save us. As I suggested on Sunday, John connects the connection of that prayer and acclamation to Isaiah and Zechariah indicates that the followers of Jesus recognized the fullness or holistic nature of the salvation on offer. But what confused this crowd was really the means of that salvation. There are two things that happen next in John's Gospel that they indicate that they stand so confused at this most pinnacle moment in the Gospel narrative. The idea that the Son of Man is to die seems horrific to them, and the idea that God would speak into their world most directly seems beyond plausible. John tells us that there were a group of Greek proselytes who had come to Jerusalem to worship during the Passover. They heard of Jesus, and they approached Philip to take them to Jesus. Philip then talks to Andrew, and the two of them go and tell Jesus. John does not tell us whether these Greeks get to meet, meet Jesus, but Jesus' response is very telling. In response, he uses an agricultural image to indicate what is to happen next. That of the death of a wheat seed and its rebirth as a plant that produces food, grain, and the possibility of regeneration. Its death is symbolized in the burial in the earth and its giving up of itself for the sake of what it produces. Jesus then transfers that image from himself to the life of his followers in that lovely contradictory way that Jesus teaches. He uses a classic rabbinical polar extreme to make the point. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. The very idea of baptism emphasizes the idea of us dying and being raised with Christ, to follow where he has gone before, because true discipleship is about patterning. And then John, in that typical style of the gospel account, lets us in into the deeper story, giving us the details of what Jesus has to say. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? 
Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I've come to this hour. A more careful translation might actually read, save or sustain me in this hour or through this hour rather than from this hour. Courage does not become because there is no fear or anguish, but rather it's shown in the midst of fear or anguish. True courage on Jesus' part is to ask that the Father may sustain him in the midst of this agony. Then Jesus picks up again on the thought of his death a few verses later on and says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Somehow or other, there's a connection there between these Greeks coming to Jesus and this statement. For for the first time in the Gospel narrative, we have this explicit assumption that salvation is for all. John is then careful to point out to us as readers that Jesus did this to indicate the type of death he was to die. This is not what the people came to hear. This is not the answer to their prayer that they're looking for. In contrast, the certainty of their belief in the biblical narrative of the Hebrew Scriptures is what they want. We have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? In other words, we know about the Son of Man whose kingdom is unending. But of the Son of Man, of whom you speak, who will be crucified, we know nothing. The Hebrew people had no difficulty in believing that God had spoken to them. God spoke to Moses through the burning bush and on Mount Sinai. God spoke to Samuel and all the prophets. God even spoke to the psalmists. But for the past few centuries, God had been awfully silent. There was even a Hebrew phrase to describe the situation they found themselves in, bath call, the daughter's voice. It is almost as if through the reading of Scripture that we get a second-hand echo handed down to us of some distant relative of the voice of God. When John places Jesus' agonizing prayer concerning his impending death into the midst of this conversation that Jesus is having with a crowd, the voice of God appears in response to Jesus' statement, Father, glorify your name. Then the voice of God is heard to say, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The voice of God appears in this very public way in all the critical points of the unfolding gospel narrative, at Jesus' baptism, at the transfiguration, and here in the midst of Jesus' agony. But the crowd is torn. Some suggest it's merely a peal of thunders, while others is, suggest it's just simply the voice of an angel that only Jesus can hear. Again, the answer they get to their prayer is not the answer they want. Not only do they not expect the Son of Man to die, but they hardly ever expect to hear the voice of God affirming that possibility. Again, as I said on Sunday and yesterday, sometimes it's hard when Jesus challenges our neatly packaged and defin definitive theology, even when it is all those biblical references neatly lined up for us. As Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. The contradiction of the passion of Christ is to be found in the very simple truth that the kingdom of God is not established through the use of might or strength or power, but rather in weakness and vulnerability. The contradiction of the passion is to be found in the, in, to, not to be found in the whispering wisdom of the past, but in the resounding voice of God speaking of God's presence, the glory of God in the now. The question is not whether God has acted in love, but rather whether we can see the love of God demonstrated and hear the voice of God present in the contradiction of Christ's passion. And as true followers of Christ, follow him into death, into foolishness, 
and into vulnerability to show our love for God and for all of God's created order. Amen. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And as I did yesterday, I'm going to use litany number 10, the litany for the evening. In priests, let us pray to the Lord, saying, We pray to you, Lord. God, we pray that this evening may be a holy, good, and peaceful one. We pray to you, Lord. That the work we have done this day and the people we have met may bring us closer to you. We pray to you, Lord. That we may be forgiven our sins and offenses. We pray to you, Lord. That we may hear and respond to your call to peace and justice. We pray to you, Lord that you will sustain the faith and hope of the weary, the lonely and the oppressed. We pray to you, Lord. This evening we pray particularly for those impacted most profoundly by this uh, virus, those who have been hospitalized, those who are sick, those who are fearful, and those who are worried. We pray that God may strengthen them in this hour, that God may carry them and sustain them in the midst of their suffering. We pray for ourselves that we would continue to be faithful witnesses of the love of God in the midst of a life of doubt. We pray that God would strengthen us in God's service and fill our hearts with longing for God's kingdom. We pray to you, Lord. Amen. And we say the collect for Holy Tuesday. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. May our lives be so transformed by his passion that we may witness to his grace, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Tomorrow will be Wednesday. And uh, we won't have a service during the day. We'll have it in the evening. We'll do evening prayer together. And I invite you to stay with us, to join us. And as I said on Sunday, um, evening prayer is a lovely service. It closes our day and puts us to rest for night. That God may sustain us and keep us. That we may wake refreshed and renewed for a new day of service. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord of peace give us peace in all ways and at all times. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.